Hi, good afternoon, guys. So we're just after the two o'clock mark. So I think well, I think we'll get rolling, and um, hopefully people can jump in. Those the, the the late arrivers, and they can catch up with us. So for those that are on at the moment, welcome. Thanks for coming to this afternoon's webinar, embracing the digital first customer. You're all very welcome. Um, a very relevant one to be for us to be doing actually in in the time that we're in. Um, certainly, embracing a digital first customer is been relevant more than ever for. A long time now we're certainly in a, a, a internet-led digital-led um, commercial landscape um, but of course the COVID-19 thing is certainly highlighted no matter what industry you're in or what business you run that um, disruption uh, can come about and when you can't deliver things physically if you have a physical service or a physical offer ensuring that you have a digital ecosystem in there to be able to have multiple revenue streams and to be able to navigate disruptive periods um, is going to be quite important. So we're going to try and talk to you a little bit about that today. My name is Wayne Willis. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues Rob Lewis and Jamie Del Grosso. Uh, we're all from a company called the Denic Group, which is an innovation agency. Um, and we work with uh, companies and organizations around the world to help them develop innovation strategies, help them to be disruptive, help them to think differently about what they do, and crucially and relevant to today's thing, how to embrace digital technology to advance forward. So uh, we'll be going through some uh, some ideas and um, some methodologies and some tools for you to be able to use to do that, and hopefully this is going to help. Uh, before I hand over to my colleague Rob, who's going to lead us through this today, um, I'd just like to say that um, the questions are open, there is a Q&A, we really do welcome any questions. We're going to be talking quite generally and hopefully it's going to apply to everybody on a general business context, but I appreciate that people attending are going to be from all different sorts of industries, offering all sorts of different products and services and uh, you all have your own unique circumstances. So please feel free to ask throughout and we'll try and answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, and with that, we'll get rolling. I'll hand over to you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. <clears throat> As Wayne said, please um, ask any questions. Wayne's going to handle the, the Q&A, so um, he'll tell me if there are any questions. I'm going to try. <laughs> so bombarding with questions, they give me an easy time. So um, I'll get on with the slides. Um, sorry. Sorry. So as, as, as Wayne said, we're from a company called the Denet Group, and we specialise in, in innovation. And um, we have really three core principles, and that's be disruptive, embrace digital, and think differently. We're actually going to cover these in the, in, in the slides. But fundamentally, all businesses are addressing this or struggling with this or thinking about this, i.e. being digital, um, how, how, how to not be disruptive, and then how to think differently. We'll cover what that means in, uh, in relation to uh, consumer-first digital innovation. So Wayne, you're going to do the polls, so just give you a hand over to this. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just there. Uh, I was quickly having a quick drink and uh, <laughs> missed the slot. It came a lot quicker. Okay, guys, so just a quick poll before we get into it. So first question to ask is, do you feel your bis business is at risk of disruption? It would just get, it'd be nice to get a, an understanding from you, um, whether you whether you think that uh, applies to you. So feel free just to jump in with a yes, no, or not sure if, if you're not sure. Um, and it'd be nice just to gauge what the sort of response is to that. Just, just about everyone. I'll just give another couple of seconds. Excellent. I think that's everyone. So, majority of you have answered yes. So, seventy-five percent of you uh, have said yes. You do feel your business is at risk of disruption. Um, Seventeen percent of you. So, um, don't don't think that. There's a risk there and uh, a small percentage of you are, are not sure um, and hopefully from going through these slides we'll be able to help uh, give you a little bit of clarification around that but that's an interesting result. Thanks Rob. Yeah okay thanks Wayne. On to, on to the slides content. Um, we're going to talk about disruption in a minute so um, hopefully, um, sorry I'm just trying to click on to the next slide it's not letting me at the moment. Oh, here we go. So we're going to think about being disruptive. Um, so the first thing is, if we're talking about disruptive, you start to think about disruptive innovation, which is a term that you hear a lot and you'll see written in um, job titles. If you look on LinkedIn, you'll find lots of job titles with this in the, in the, in the description. Um, it's actually a term that was first coined by a guy called Clayson Christensen in about um, 2012. 
And he was writing in the Harvard Business Review, reviewing um, examples of businesses that have gone bust. And he was thinking about Kodak specifically um, and really thinking about what and defining about what does that actually mean. And the way he defined disruptive innovation was a new entrant into a market that starts with a small market share, but gradually um, grows and actually starts to grow quite quickly and eventually uh, replaces the incumbent business. And as I said, he was talking, talking about Kodak at the time, and we know what happened with that particular business and its failure to get into digital um, um, media. So th that, that's how the, he was defining uh, disruptive innovation. And there are some examples coming up on this slide. I'm sorry, it's been really slow on my uh, computer. So we know, we know there are lots of classic examples of, um, of companies who have, uh, have seen disruption in different sectors. It's obviously Uber with taxi travel, Netflix with um, film, Airbnb with um, hotels, and Babylon, which is a UK health um, product, which is really disrupting the sort of GP space. And we'll talk about some of these later. Um, but fundamentally, what, what we're seeing is these are people coming into a sector thinking very differently about it and being quite aggressive and looking at how they disrupt the way things are currently done. And one thing that's common among all of these is they're very digital. So digital is very important in disruption and it's causing a lot of change in the market. Okay, so that, that's kind of the definition of disruptive innovation. As I said, as I said you can read about it in Harvard Business Review, um, but it's all very well reading an article. What, what's actually happening in real life this is some data from the um, Standard & Poor Fortune 500 um, index, which is an American stock indice, and they looked at um, corporate lifespans and found out actually that corporate lifespans were, were reducing. And what we're seeing over time in this chart is the average duration of a corporation, is get, uh, its lifetime is getting less and less. And what that is showing is that some of these big companies who would expect to be around for 10, 20, 100 years are actually not finding that anymore. And that's been because of disruption, disruption in the marketplace, things that people are doing that are not relevant any longer, they're getting replaced by new businesses. And what's really interesting about this is actually thinking about what's going to happen in the future. And they predicted in this article, in the, text, in the next 10 years, half of the companies in the S&P 500 index will be replaced. And many of those will be replaced by companies that don't exist today. So what we're seeing is new people coming into the market and really changing the way things are doing and generating very, very large valuations and becoming very big businesses very quickly. So another poll, Wayne, do you want to run this poll for us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the next one is, um, does your company actively embrace digital technology? So within your business, uh, are you all for it? Do you love digital technology? Are you totally against it? Is it dependent on the situation? Um, again, everyone will have their own. Um, their own scenario. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, about two, th about two thirds of you um, are saying yes, you do actively embrace it. Hopefully, you can see the results there. Um, but. Uh, and, and but nobody's saying no, which is really good. That's good news. Um, and uh, some of you are saying somewhat. So a third of you are saying somewhat, which is likely probably dependent on what the situation is and um, your own business. Um, but it's good that we haven't got a no there. So that's a positive start. Thanks, Rob. So coming on to digital, a uh, question is if you're looking at digital, is what is digital technology? Is it having a Facebook site? Is it having a fully integrated digital ecosystem? And fundamentally, digital technology can be used either um, in physical technology, so it could be a wearable, some form of hardware, or virtual technology, the software that effectively um, controls something, and that aids the function or the operation of an act. And this is in a consumer sense, everything can be made digital potentially, but it should only be able to be done where it makes sense to the consumer and adds a benefit to that. So this is just a, an example of what um, office spaces used to be like, and I'm sure, well, I can certainly remember working in an environment like this. It used to be that um, to run a company, you needed large premises, um, you needed lots of workstations, massive infrastructure, and digital has changed that. So now, digitally, you could run a very similar office space to that from home, everybody empowered by powerful software and uh, have great digital um, equipment. Um, and that's one form of digital revolution, the way we work, and we see that changing workplaces, 
lots of people working from home, particularly in the current situation. Um, startup pubs are empowered by digital technology and we see a lot more flexibility in the workplace. So that's one element of digital technology. The other part of digital is it's becoming smarter and smarter. And actually, um, we've heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is an example from Google, who have a, um, a very uh, complicated um, artificial intelligence engine that can be directed against any kind of problem. And in this particular problem, um, it was given the components of a human body and the limbs that we have, and, and asked to figure out how to walk. And what, what the computer did without any human input was assemble the human body and get it to traverse these obstacles. So showing that um, computers can actually learn by themselves. And we know that uh, predicted that a lot of jobs will be replaced by computers because of this, um, which is, a, I guess, a negative side of it. But actually, the, there is a positive, because actually, this will make our lives easier. It gives us more and more uh, abilities to solve problems and actually provide better consumer um, solutions, which will generate more jobs. So it's just a, uh, an evolution in the way we're doing things. Um, but AI and machine learning are uh, giving this kind of capability. In terms of what, what happens with technology, as we know, we all know from our own lifestyle, uh, from, from being from uh, our own growth, from being a child, so the technology that's available to us now, we can only we can look back a few years ago and see how quickly technology has advanced. And here's some um, research that shows how quickly technology advances. So every five years, technology gets 32 times more advanced. Um, so that's kind of scary, but that, that growth is exponential. So if you look at that over 10 years, you become a thousand times more advanced. And if you look at that over 20 years, it becomes a million times more advanced. So we can see the things we can do today are way more technically adept than they were five years ago or 10 years ago. But if we fast forward, we'll see an even greater rate of change. So if you're a business who's not thinking about using digital technology, um, you're really missing out on this hugely powerful tool to be able to create and do way more um, interesting things than you were able to do before. So it offers a massive source of innovation. <clears throat> this is an example of, of the first touchscreen phones. This was actually um, developed in 1991, which actually doesn't seem that long ago to me, but it's a relatively long time ago. But in that relatively short space of time, we've gone from this, what now looks like a very primitive phone, to having a, a very, very advanced smartphone in our pocket with highly interactive touchscreen displays. That's just one example of how um, the development of technology or the speed of technology evolution is enabling new solutions and seeing how companies are delivering solutions to address that. <clears throat> another, another explosion in technology is around mixed reality. So this is an example of um, a, 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 a virtual reality solution where the operator here is using, has been immersed in a virtual reality world with a headset and they're able to control that environment using the handsets. And this can be done to um, manipulate machines, can be used to learn, can be used in all sorts of different applications. And this technology is, is really a burgeoning technology, something that's been relatively niche so far. We're going to see more and more applications of this, um, and it opens up all sorts of possibilities for innovation. So the other thing we talked about with our 3Ds is think differently. So um, in, any, in any given um, sector, people tend to think similarly because we tend to be academically similar or grow up in a, in a culture or an environment in that business, um, which is generally similar in a, a specific sector. And on top of that, a lot of industries are regulated. So that tends to conform the way we think. If you want to innovate, you need to be able to think differently. So um, there are fundamentally two approaches to innovation. And um, one approach is displayed by incumbent businesses. And by incumbent businesses, we mean the businesses have been around for a long time, who have good market share, um, or classic big companies or big brand thinking. And their primary approach to innovation is playing not to lose. They're, 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 they always think first uh, about maintaining the business they have because they've got a lot to lose. They're getting paid every month, they're getting bonuses, they're getting promoted, they want to maintain their market share, they want to maintain their share price. And fundamentally, that's their primary thing when they think about when they're innovating. They're effectively playing not to lose where they are, what they have today. And where we're seeing disruption is where people um, display the other um, approach to innovation. And the other approach to innovation is playing to win. And we, we tend to see disruptive companies or disruptive innovators um, having this approach to win. And they're going and looking at how things are done today. They're looking at unmet consumer needs and they're finding out and figuring out new ways of doing it. 
And in that, in that ounce, they're disrupting the marketplace and they're delivering disruptive innovation. So there's a really interesting dynamic today. And this is how Airbnb, um, Uber, and Netflix, the examples we showed at the beginning, are coming about. They're effectively looking at businesses and working out better ways to do it and disrupting that business. So there's a very, very interesting dynamic. And it's all, it's classically very hard for incumbent businesses to embrace some of these characteristics as approaches to innovation that disruptive, that the disruptive innovators have. Um, and we'll touch on that in a few minutes. This is a quote that we saw once in the presentation given by a lady from Wired, Wired Magazine. And she said, legacy companies have too much to gain from the present and think too much about the future. And this, if anyone's worked in a large corporation, you probably recognize this kind of behavior. But fundamentally, if you make a lot of money doing something today, you don't have too much incentive to look at and do things differently in the future because you, you know, you're very comfortable. And that's, again, the kind of the opposite, the antidote to disruptive innovation, if you like. Um, we mentioned Kodak earlier, but Kodak filed for bankruptcy, bankruptcy uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, you will probably remember that their business model was built around, digital, around physical film and they continued to, uh, they obviously had a massive infrastructure and lots of money coming in from Kodak physical film. And what that meant is they were blindsided by the digital um, camera revolution. Now, the irony in this is actually they were the company who invented the digital camera. So this guy was a Kodak employee and in the 1970s, he, he developed the first digital camera. But because the company was so comfortable doing what they did with digital film, they never saw the opportunity to, um, to commercialize that technology. And eventually it was a decision that put them, out of, um, put them out of business. So you really need to be alive to the things that can disrupt and destroy your business. Wayne, over to you, so quick poll. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, so uh, do you feel empowered to take risk and fail? This is an interesting one um, and probably fun to, fundamental to all, all innovation, which we're going to touch upon uh, as we go through. Um, but within your own business, um, have you got the freedom to try stuff, do things? Is failure an option um, or are you, are you restricted from that? Oh, it's moving about a bit. Okay, just a couple more seconds. Great, thanks very much, guys. So around about half of you, just over half of you say, yes, you have, you do feel empowered. You do feel like you're able to take risks and try things out. Um, 23% of you, no, absolutely not. And 23% uh, of you, not sure, which, which could suggest that um, within your own business, um, there isn't like a company-wide strategy or mission or vision that you're all following um, and, and engaged in. So that might form part of that. So um, we'll, we'll touch upon that as we start running through. Thanks very much. Thanks. As Wayne said, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to the whole thing around risks. It's, uh, Develop, um, embedded in, in, in the culture of an organization and often taking risks is very uncomfortable. All companies um, talk with bad platitudes about um, saying it's okay to fail, but actually very rarely do people feel that empowered to, to do so. Um, so we're now going to cover some of the essentials of innovation um, as we see them. And fundamentally, there are three components to a great innovation system. Firstly, the strategy, and we'll say what that means in a minute, but it's basically where are you going, the process of is how do you get there and the culture is, is how do you do that and, and what's it like to work there. And we'll come into each of these uh, in the next subsequent slides. So strategy really is your roadmap, it's where are you going. You have, it will be probably um, uh, uh, illustrated by some form of vision that you might want to be number one in your sector or you may want to change the business in a certain direction or be the greenest company in the world. Those kind of things would be strategic um, directions for the organisation. And sitting under that would be innovation goals. So how do you move your innovation in line to achieving that overall strategy? And that's really supported by um, a portfolio of innovation. So um, a number of projects, which are effectively the projects that are going to get you there. And you would have some way of measuring that in, in some way. And it's also supported by insight, insight stimulus and trend identification. So in other words, knowing what's going on in your market. So what your competitors are, go, are doing, where do consumers um, want to be, what are the unmet consumer needs, um, what kind of trends are there happening in the world. And all of that really forms a strategy. So strategy should be um, um, verbalised by the leadership in an organisation. 
and it should be instilled in everyone who works there and what the strategy is. And you should be using that strategy um, statement as your guiding light. And I think it's an important thing to ask yourself um, if this is a strategy of our business, is what I am doing, is what am I doing today? Is that aligned with that strategy as a department or as a bigger team? Are we pushing in the right direction? All those kind of questions are important to set your innovation stall out. Um, the kind of more mechanistic side to innovation is the process. So um, the process really is the, like um, having a process in innovation is actually really important. Some people think the process in innovation is it's kind of an oxymoron, um, but no, it's not. And you, uh, having a process is really about how do you go about being innovative. So it's really the tools that allow you to be innovative. So you may have an innovation process like a sprint or something. You may have tools for doing ideation. All of these things make the job of innovation um, more um, robust. Um, you have project management that sits under this, you have budget and funding to allow you to do this and a, a way of coming up with ideas. Um, so strategy and process are really the uh, are two elements uh, of, the, of the three that we think are involved with innovation. But culture is the absolute number one um, uh, component of innovation. And, and culture really is uh, how your people are empowered, um, how they operate. Um, it, it's really that undefinable feeling you get when you go into a place. It, it, uh, it's not about having fucking furniture and ins inspirational posters on the wall. It's about the way people act. It's about the, just the general sense of an organization that you get and it's very very hard to have um well it's impossible to have great innovation if you don't have the right culture and this is where risk is addressed so really people in your organization need to feel very secure that they can take risks that they can experiment and that they can be allowed to fail that's all part of the culture of the organization and if you get this right you can have some great innovation or prospects um, just talking on talking about innovation there are lots of um, companies who have very strong cultures and um, we'll just give you a few examples of those. So one example uh, is, is in gaming. So there's a company called Valve, who are, 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 are a game company, and they were up against an incumbent. EA, EA Games are a massive um, gaming company, and, and Valve have effectively created a culture which has caused them to have a better business than EA, EA, EA Games. Um, so let's just take to the next slide. So. EA Games effectively a, a, a huge um, gaming organization and they've actually been quite cynical in the way that they've innovated. Um, they basically stole uh, of, of, of taken games and set them against um, popular movies. Um, they've put um, features in there that are required to be paid um, and all of this put gamers offside and effectively um, took them from being the darlings of the gaming industry to being, to being a villain of the, of the gaming industry. Whereas Valve um, had a culture which allowed them to um, continue to be relevant to, to gamers uh, and um, effectively uh, serve that market better. And Jamie, do you have anything to add on that one? That's your um, example. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Valve, uh, when they were looking at this, so uh, EA and Valve at the time were both um, sort of on an on a even sort of level. They were both considered uh, what we call AAA game develop developers, so right at the top of the field. Um, and both were racing to be the, the number one. Um, EA's approach to this was, well, let's just push out as many games as possible um, and make as much money from those games as pos possible. So they were pushing their developers to rush deadlines. They were pushing them to add things into the game to make additional money. Um, and what actually happened is internally, um, there was a bit of a of a mutiny, if you like, where the, the developers of EA were speaking out about the terrible work culture um, and the way that they were not able to produce good quality games. Valve, on the other hand, uh, they actually didn't look at the games themselves. They looked at their internal culture and they created uh, a book, the Valve Culture Guide, which uh, if you're ever looking at internal culture, uh, Google uh, the Valve Culture Book and it's, uh, it's got some really interesting concepts in there. But the main concept was only work on projects that you feel passionate about. Uh, so if people are working on projects and they weren't passionate about it, they wouldn't put 110% into it. So they would move to another project. If they had projects where nobody was passionate about it, they deemed that it would be basically a poor game anyway. Uh, so they, they scrapped it and they moved on. Uh, and what ended up happening was EA produced a lot of very rushed games at very low quality that were there to basically make money. 
uh, Valve ended up creating very top, good quality games that people really enjoyed. Um, and as everything is happens nowadays, uh, the internet basically, basically backlashed against EA. Uh, a lot of memes went up basically saying that EA was just there to make money. Um, where Valve, on the other hand, every time they release the game, and to this day when Valve release a game, people rush to buy it because it's a Valve game without much knowledge of the game itself uh, because they've created that reputation. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Jeremy mentioned a really important part of culture there, and that's really knowing what motivates your team and by giving people the opportunity to, to work on projects they love, you get better results, which is what Valve showed. I mean, often we don't have the luxury of that in a working environment, but you really need to be able to motivate your team and give them opportunities to, that, that match their motivations, and that's fundamentally what the culture of the organisation becomes. Um, another example um, of a strong corporate culture is Facebook. So when you, when you join Facebook, apparently you get this little red book, and that's um, like a, a, effectively a physical iteration of their culture. And what they uh, state in that book is, if we don't create the thing that kills Facebook, somebody else will. So in other words, what they're saying to the, their guys is, get out there, anticipate what's going to change our business, and let's, let's disrupt ourselves, which is a really, uh, 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 for any organization that doesn't want to be disrupted, this is exactly the kind of behavior that you need to be able to instill. Um, if you can read the, the side there, the last paragraph says, the things that don't, that don't say relevant um, don't even get the luxury of leaving ruins, they just disappear. So in other words, no one remembers the, the things that you're using five years ago, they're always on to the next thing. So you have to continue to keep changing your business models and keep up with this and this demand. Okay, okay we're just going to check in on the types of um, digital innovation. So one type of digital innovation is automation. So it's using digital technology to automate processes. Zero is a classic example of that. So um, a lot of startup companies or even much larger companies will run on zero today. It's an accounting software. So rather than having an accounts team, you can automate all those processes and look after your accounts um, with a simple to use app and a digital ecosystem like Xero. So a lot of these um, systems are being very, very large and displacing um, large departments. Another example of automation is Babylon. I mentioned it at the start, but Babylon Health is, is something that's probably going to become very large in the UK. It's a, it was a UK startup. I think they've gone to other countries now. But fundamentally, it uses telemedicine to connect people to GPs. So it's great for the NHS because it takes people out of the GP waiting room, which obviously reduces the strain on doctors. Um, but it's also great for consumers because um, it means you can have an appointment when suits you. Um, without having to take any time off work or if you're ill, having to leave your house. And it's, it can all be done by telemedicine. But also they have an artificial intelligence engine which can actually help answer the symptoms and questions you may have gone to ask your doctor about. So in other words, it's increasing the capacity of the healthcare system. And actually if you use NHS 111 today, the AI that sits behind some of those responses is, is what's provided by Babylon. They've also expanded into um, health kits, so you can go on there and get all sorts of biochemical tests, which can help you help inform you about your health. So it's it's really a, a really interesting health ecosystem, which is replacing or, or, or augmenting rather GPs and providing lab tests for you from the convenience of your own home. So that's, that's a couple of examples of um, of automation. Next, we're going to talk about information and gamification. One of the great things about digital is that it collects a lot of information and that information can be processed and used to solve consumer problems or give the user information. And gamification is really relevant here because um, for someone to use a digital platform, it has to be good, it has to be uh, involving, it has to absorb the user in the experience. Uh, and that's often done by gamifying um, the, pro, the, the, the benefit. So an example of this is the activity monitor. Um, these are all Fitbits, obviously, and Fitbit, um, from being a concept a few years ago, is now a massive business. And actually, not just Fitbits, but physical activity mo monitors are actually fairly ubiquitous. Probably everyone on the call at least knows someone who has one or, or, or have, have one themselves. But fundamentally, what, what these things are doing uh, is convert converting simple information like steps or heart rate into actionable health data. So it can tell you how long you've slept, it can tell you how your heart's moving, as how your heart's working, and it can tell you how much physical activity you've done. And actually physical activity is one of the key concerns of our health. So this is a really interesting health product 
what sits at the heart of it as well as all the information and quantification and quantified self-information it gives you is the gamification element of it. So the very, the very fact that Fitbit went out there and said that 10,000 steps um, is the right amount of physical activity everyone should be doing every day, that in itself gamified physical activity. So when you buy a Fitbit, you will be thinking about how much, how much you're moving. They've also put some really interesting functionality into, into their platform, which allows you to compete against people in your family, create teams, et cetera, and, and see who's doing the most steps or having the healthiest lifestyle. It's a great example of combining information with gamification. Um, this is another example, which is, um, feels a bit black mirror, this one to me, but this is a uh, compete and it's uh, used to gamify performance in call centers. So they, they collect information and give operators in the call center um, scores. So people in the call center can effectively gamify their, their, their job. And this is obviously great for management because it means people are being more effective, but presumably it's linked to some form of uh, reward and incentive and it, it, it uh, basically provides that whole gamification element of, a, of the job. <clears throat> Next one is integration. So we're seeing technology being integrated into all sorts of elements of our lives. Um, you know, things like sat nav when they first came around were, were something that you know massive massive numbers of people got sat navs. They um, all, all bought a car with that option on there, and now you see that actually incorporated into your mobile phone. So every time you go into your car, you've got a very powerful sat nav um, that's actually sitting on your phone. Um, this particular case is like a, a digital home connected home cup type application where things in the house are being connected through IoT and we will see technology in the future. Well, it's already, we're already with us, but it will become more and more ubiquitous. Lots of smart home devices. Um, we know things like Nest are there to control your um, the environment in your home so you can control and set your heating, which allows you to be able to have that temperature of the house right um, when you're even not in the house, allows you to save money, look at your energy consumption, etc. We have things like connected fridges, which can potentially re, um, see when we're, when we're running low of certain foods and, and reorder in some form of um, e-commerce ecosystem. And arguably that's uh, an interesting um, carbon saving initiative as well, because it's making sure we, we're making the most of the food that we buy. And, and we're, we're effectively, there's, there's probably in the future, there'll be nothing in our homes which doesn't have some form of um, of integration, you know, we can go and ring the doorbell today so that when the, the guy rings the doorbell, if you're not in, you can even talk to him um, unless he's leaving a parcel somewhere. Um, and obviously there's a huge security element to this um, with the images it captures and it's becoming harder and harder to commit crime because of that. So this integration of technology is, uh, is you know, it's already quite advanced, but it will become more and more advanced as, as uh, uh, in the next few years. And if you refer back to the um, chart about the evolution of technology and think about how, how much advance we get every five or ten years, you can see where this is all going. Um, another example of automation or integration rather is, is automatic. This is a bit of technology that actually fits into the diagnostic port in your car. So when you if you got um, when you when you take your car to get service, they plug out, they plug in the laptop into your computer, into your car rather. Um, this this little piece of kit does that and effectively allows you to um, to get information about your car. So how many journeys have I done? Um, what's my fuel performance? Lots of those kind of diagnostics is taking um, the sensor information in your car and effectively presenting it through you, um, to you through your mobile phone um, and an app. So great example of um, integration of technology there. Um, Personalisation, um, we're seeing, um, well, today, in, uh, from, in terms of consumer offerings, we have more um, personalization is almost mind boggling. Um, we used to go out buying a car and having lots and lots of different options. But every element of our life now is, 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 is tailorable, often because of digital technology. Um, and we get a personalized experience. Netflix is a great example of that, where you effectively have a great powerful home entertainment or, or visual system, um, but it's personalized. So everyone in your family has their own avatar. And what that means is um, they can serve up content which is relevant to you. It's relevant and age appropriate for the different people, different ages in your family. It's also relevant to um, your tastes because it learns what you like and starts to serve up offerings and suggestions to you that are relevant to your um, particular circumstances. Um, communication and productivity is another element of um, digital um, innovation. And I'm sure for all of the guys here today, we've probably got a lot of people working from home and we're seeing massive um, uh, 
improvements in the way we do that with things like Zoom, um, Microsoft Teams, which was launched pretty much right at the right time. You know, these, these kind of ways of doing work are becoming more and more ubiquitous, and particularly as we move into what you use the horrible term, the new normal, whatever that may be, um, certainly part of that will be having more work flexibility. Um, that's often empowered by technology. For people who use Slack, I'm sure lots of people here will be using Slack. You can create a channel and you can effectively communicate to people on that channel. Um, and you can, you can effectively work together in a working place in a very slick um, and digital um, manner. Virtualization, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but virtualization is, is using mixed reality. So it could be augmented reality, uh, which is basically um, applying a layer of digital information over the real world through something like your phone or smart glasses. This is an example of virtual reality, which is a more immersive experience where you're literally taken into a virtual world um, through um, uh, a headset. And that headset allows you to explore that world and interact with it. In this case, um, it's looking at surgery, and, it, and this guy presumably is a training surgeon. Um, they were learning how to, uh, to perform almost like some form of um, knee operation there. Obviously, this is a great education tool. It's also a great tool for, um, uh, for, 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 for learning because actually before, if you wanted to do this, you would be working on cadavers or you would be working on models or you would be working on live patients. And obviously that's quite expensive and um, difficult to do. Whereas at least with this, you can do it in a low risk, um, low cost, risk-free environment. So you can start to learn how to play in these surfaces that's been done here. Um, without having to go into the real person's knee, which is obviously beneficial to both student and patient. Okay, so just thinking about a digital product, what is a digital product so you understand some of that terminology? <clears throat> Fundamentally, there are three components of the digital technology, the storage, the back end, the front end, and how that technology is delivered. Uh, we can think about that as the analogy of a car. So if we think about a car, um, storage is fundamentally the fuel, so the power to run the car is stored in the fuel tank, which is either petrol, diesel, or, or as it's becoming more common now, battery, um, and that's storage. And the back end is really the engine that drives the technology. Obviously, in terms of a car, that's the chassis and the engine, but in terms of digital product, that could be a very different back end. It would involve servers and digital manipulation of information. And then you have the front end. So the front end is really what you see and, and it's really what sells the technology. So in the, in, in the case of a car, a lot of cars actually have very similar um, chassis and engines but they're packaged up in very different ways and it makes them more appealing to, to buy uh, and that's really the front end, how it's delivered. And also very important to all this is the user experience. So what's it like to use that product in the, in the analogy of the car? What's it like to sit in that car? How does it feel to steer? to steer it, how does it feel to interact with the entertainment system, how do you feel when you're in it. it all of these are important elements to uh, digital experience. So, you know, we all know good apps, we all know bad apps, and the good apps are the ones that have a great user experience um, because they make it simple and easy to use and offer lots of rewards for things like gamification, etc. some of the elements we've touched on before. Um, to think about a, a consumer products in a, in a, in a, in a different way, um, we can think about the elements of how you might digitize a product or service. So depending on where you start, here's the kind of an anatomy of a digital product. So imagine you were a drinks manufacturer and you were providing a, an analog product, which is a bottle. How, how do you make that into a digital product? So first thing, you might want to look at the packaging. So you may put a smart packaging onto it. So it could be, for example, an RFID tag, which allows you to know when you consume that product. That could be linked to buying it fresh um, to replenishment, could be linked to, um, to shelf life, it could be linked to some form of trigger for the digital experience. You could use things like AR, um, QR codes or um, digital pack triggers to, to create an uh, augmented reality experience, for example, from, from the bottle. And that would all be done through smart packaging. You may have a connected, a connected device that sits with your um to sit alongside your analog product so for example if it's an analog product or a drink and it was lucasade a connected device product that might fit with that could be a fitbit so lucasade is a fuel for doing sport and activity and a fitbit manages and um and, uh, uh, allows you to gamify and measure the amount of activity you're doing you probably have some form of engagement or service which is digital which can either be run from a 
desktop or device uh, or, a, or a mobile phone. So that could be um, like a, a brand website, it could be um, e-commerce, it could be the app that controls the connected device. So that brings us into apps. Um, a lot, um, you may have an app that controls a connected device, you may have an app that works alongside um, the analog product. And all of this shares information into the cloud. So all of these elements of connectivity are sending information into the cloud, which is giving you data and value about your consumer, how your products are used, where they use, what people are doing with them, what people think of them. And then the other side of this is e-commerce. So you can use the data in the cloud to know when the consumer has used the product and suggest they rebuy it. They could be buying from a, a, a digital shop that you, an e-commerce site you put on your app, or it could be triggered straight from the, the product. So you can see that this builds up a quite a complex potentially ecosystem. But each of these touch points, there's value to the manufacturer and to the consumer. So to think about that in a specific example, <clears throat> um, this is a product from Rocket Venki, so who are obviously a local manufacturer of healthcare products um, in this area in Hull. Um, and they have the Neurofen brand and a subset of that is Neurofen for children, which is a children's analgesic and ibuprofen suspension. And a couple of years ago, they launched this product, which is um, a Neurofen Fever Smart, and it's a wearable um, device which the baby wears under their armpit and it communicates the temperature of the child to an app on the parent's phone. And this is a really interesting consumer proposition because um, a big insight for um, parents of febrile children is they will, be, they will have um, anxiety about the kid's fever state. And this product allows them to monitor that overnight and acts as a um, reassurance to the parent, but also has an important medical um, uh, value because it can tell you when to redress the product. Um, what's also really interesting about this product is um, because it requires an app to use it, um, the user has to um, basically um, register details on the app and those details include the child, the child's sex, the child's age. So what happens then is as the manufacturer, the manufacturer can actually then contact that, that, the, um, the um, parents of that child at certain points in the child's life to cross sell other products from that company. So for example, um, if this was a, a female child, a girl rather, um, we know when it's 12 months, 12 weeks old because it starts using neurofilm for children. We now know when that girl is um, age 13 and likely to be having their first period. So neurofilm as a brand can start to communicate to that family to say ibuprofen is great for period pain. It might be when the kids are active and doing sports that they start to um, talk about the benefits of ibuprofen for sports. But also it goes across to their brand portfolio. So when the parents have a baby, they may be more interested in Gaveston, which is another RB brand, because they have indigestion because of pregnancy, or they are more worried about germs, so they might want to use Dettol. So it creates a whole ecosystem for the manufacturers to start to begin to talk to the, to the consumers about all of the policy services that they can offer them, and that has great value. <clears throat> when quick poll. Yeah, we're getting through these uh, we're close to the end of the polls, guys, don't worry, but uh, it's really interesting insight. So the question, um, are you agile in terms of moving your business model and offer to meet your customers' needs? Okay, people stop using what you're doing or they're not really into it or they've moved to a different direction. How agile are you in, in, in moving around to, to, meet what, um, to meet what they're looking for? Give a few more seconds. Okay, I think I think we're there. Okay, so that, that's pretty close, really. Um, so just, just under 60% of you. Uh, yes, Phil, you are agile. You are able to adjust and move about as, as is one needed. Uh, nobody said no. Um, uh, which is good. That's it's, 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 it's good news to read. But and, and a lot of people are saying they're not sure, and that, and that might well be because you don't have um, uh, multiple uh, ecosystems built into the way that your business works, and um, so you probably are able to be agile, but you're not quite sure how to do it. Um, and hopefully, some of this information that we're putting across will help you navigate that. Thanks, Rob. Okay, thanks, Wayne. So really, that, that agility is really important if you're a traditional business and you want to become digital because the chances are you don't have the, the skills internally to become digital and you're going to have to have some form of agility in terms of accessing um, that capability. 
um, but, and looking at the, the, the business models that sit behind digital. So we're now going to talk about consumer needs. So one of the key rules of innovation is don't just do things because you can do them. They have to offer some form of value. Um, we often talk about MVPs in, in digital innovation, which is a minimum viable product. Those MVPs need to offer value to the consumer, otherwise there's no point in doing them. So a big, a big element that I think is important is not just doing digital for the sake of doing digital, it has to add value to the consumer experience. And we're just going to cover this. Um, we, we see five things, the five E's, so E's, entertainment, economics, education, and ecosystem. Let me just take you through those. So really, ease is about services and products, and remember a product can be physical, it can be digital, or it can be a service, but fundamentally, the things that need to add ease and make um, the, the user's um, operation of that product more efficient. So it could be around automation of a task, it could be additional functionality that allows them to give a better control on the more use of something. We mentioned user experience before, um, it has to have a user-friendly user experience, and basically makes a uh, user's life easier in some way. So that's one, one consumer benefit. The next one is entertainment. So it could be a service or a product that adds an element of excitement or entertainment to the user. Um, so this could be from the, the platform itself, um, or it could be you, the platform just being, being used as a facilitator of that entertainment. So Netflix is basically a, a platform which facilitates entertainment through the medium of the films that it displays. Um, where some platforms are entertaining in themselves. So entertainment takes us on to economic. So um, a product or a service that offers a cheaper cost or a better value or an alternative payment method. There are lots of ways you can build the economic side of stuff um, digitally in, in, these, in, in, in with the technology that's allowed. So um, it allows you to do things that are better cost to the consumer, also potentially allows you to make more money because you can potentially maintain a higher margin. Um, and you can collect money in different in different ways. Education is about providing new information or access to data um, that allows people to get the, to effectively get more knowledge about things. So digital health is a classic example where digital platforms provide a user with much more information about health, things that are relevant to their health, and that person can then um, use that knowledge to effectively modify their um, lifestyle. Ecosystem is really um, about um, delivering innovation which fits within an ecosystem of existing products that someone's using. So Apple's a really good example of this where you have an operating system which kind of sits across everything. We have lots of different iterations of the devices that are used. So um, obviously things like um, iPhone is the first real smartphone that sat alongside your iOS operating system and works alongside all the apps on your desktop computer. Then you have things like iPad coming out, which were really the first people to work out their computer doesn't need to have a keyboard. You've now got things like Apple Watch, and there's a whole panoply of things that, that, that Apple um, deliver that if you're in the Apple ecosystem, it's very easy to bring in that next thing. And once you're actually in that ecosystem, it's very hard to get out of it because if you've got an iPhone and it works so well with your iPhone, with your MacBook, um, you would probably think twice about switching your phone. Um, so it's really, really profitable way to bring people into an ecosystem because once you've got them, you've got them for a long time potentially, if you do it well. And where do you want to do this quick poll? Yeah, thanks Rob. So this is the last one. Um, so uh, does your core business offer generate income from multiple revenue streams? Um, it, 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 are you making your, your revenue from just the core thing that you offer, the one thing you put out, or do you have multiple revenue streams where, where one's not doing so well, it's fine because there's multiple others coming in. I'll just give you a couple more seconds. A few more still voting here. Okay, guys. Okay, I think we're just about there, so I'll, I'll, I'll pull it there. Okay, so 64% of you, yes, you do have multiple revenue streams. There's, there's income coming in from multiple sources, which is good news. Um, a small percentage, 18%, 18% no, you, you are just solely relying on that, that one output. Um, and 18% um, of you are not too sure. 
Um, but just going back to some of the points Rob was just saying there about the digital ecosystem, you know, and connecting things together, even if you're making something physical and you connect it to a digital world, the opportunity for opening up new markets, new revenues, new touch points becomes much faster because you're not relying on that, that physical output that you're doing. So again, everyone that's watching will have their own specific scenario and maybe your, um, an entertainment provider, maybe you're a training provider, maybe you sell a physical product. Um, all of those have their, their, their own physical way of delivering. But if you could connect it to a digital ecosystem, um, then the opportunity is for, for you to be able to leverage um, value from each of those touch points becomes much greater and then obviously helps you not to be um, disruptive, uh, be, be, become disrupted rather, and be more disruptive in being able to navigate um, down periods such as what we're experiencing now in the COVID situation. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, man. Okay, so we're just going to take you through some um, different ways of thinking to add value to your business. As Wayne mentioned with that poll there, that um, the more um, ways you have of making money, the more innovative your business can be. So it's not just about putting products in a box and selling it through a supermarket. So I think there are other ways that you can make money from that, um, that value stream and those, and those consumers. So we, we like to think about um, businesses in three ways. So the core of your business is really um, we're using the analogy of the tree, it's like the trunk of the tree, and it's really what the, the product that the consumer uses. And as I said before, product doesn't just have to be a physical product, it could be a service and it could be a digital product. Um, the roots of your business are really how your business is configured, so it's how do you make your product, um, the factories that you use, what's your supply um, stream, um, what's the profit model, um, how do you get your products to the head, um, out of the factory to, to, to the retailer. Um, and the reach of the products is really the touch point. So it's how your how your how your consumers and market um, interact with the product. Where do they buy it? How do they use it? How do you communicate about that product? So we can think about how do we innovate in each of these three different sort of segments. Uh, so we look at the three pillars of innovation, as I just said, the roots, the core, the outreach, um, and the roots are really the uh, what the uh, uh, below the line of visibility. The consumer doesn't see these, so it's how your team's structured, um, what's your profit model, how do you create your products, um, and the, the supply the supply side, and what network's involved in delivering that product, supply chain, etc. You can innovate in all these different areas, it doesn't just have to be about products. The core really is the product, so the product itself, so what is your core product? Again, digital, um, physical, or service, um, but then also think about what are the complementary offerings can you add? Can you add to that? We, we mentioned Neurofin earlier, and um, effectively that, that digital thermometer is a complementary offering to Neurofin for children, securing an ecosystem of products there. And then outreach is really um, how do you interact in the market? So bells and whistles are kind of like what services can you add to a product? Just make the experience of using that product better. Outreach is how do you market it? Public image is all about what's that brand about? And interaction is how do you interact with those consumers? So you can innovate in any of these different ways. And the more of these ways that you innovate, the better the innovation and the potentially the more streams of value you have. So if we think about meaningful innovation, um, digital innovation has to fulfill a digital need. And we talked about those scopes, so the things we just talked about, the different elements of your business that you can innovate around. And if you can leverage all of these things together, so use digital innovation, to meet them that consumer need that can work across a number of different areas of your business, you can have very meaningful innovation. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, Rob, as well, I think um, with this side, uh, I mean, I know that throughout this presentation, we've thrown quite a lot of different bits of information um, at you guys that are watching. Uh, but when you start to add them together, so when you consider the different types of innovation, so what we talked about with the automation or personalization, we use that to address a consumer need so whether it's making it uh, easier to use more exciting uh, or any of the other ease um, and then apply that to one of the scopes so basically an element of your business um, so for example if you uh, look at automation and the consumer need of um, the economics of it um, so you change your profit model to rather than being a single payment for a large product maybe they use a, an app or a digital system to pay a subscription service um, you're now adding a meaningful innovation to your product. So you're increasing the ways that you can make income, uh, but you're adding some value to the consumer as well. 
Um, and that's really what all this information has been about, um, how you can take the product or service you have um, and use digital to expand on it and to create a wider ecosystem. Uh, one for the benefits of profit, but um, also uh, in terms of, um, of resilience as well. So if we look at the situation we're in now, uh, where a lot of people are not able to fulfill their standard operations as a business, by having that dig digital ecosystem, um, you're suddenly able to continue or at least have uh, another arm of your business that may continue. Um, so really, uh, all these things when brought together really do create something a bit more meaningful to you and to your consumers. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so I'm just going to give you an example of, of, of this in real life using the example of Dollar Shave Club, which is quite an old um, business now, but it's really, really relevant to what we're talking about now. So you may have seen this video, you may not have seen it, but I'm just going to play it and then I'll tell you how this relates to what we've just told you. Hopefully you can hear all of this. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. <laughs> So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. Sorry guys, I'm, my uh, my video is a little bit out of sync with this with the sound there, so I'm, I'm, yours may have been as well. But um, Doll Shave Club really was about um, it was actually founded by the guy there who actually works at Procter and Gamble, who were the guys who make Gillette, and he had he knew the um, he knew about the um, uh, the bill made consumer um, need for around shaving. It was the whole nonsense around shave shave innovation was like that thing adding a new functionality to a razor that already works really, really well, so putting another blade on, adding a aloe vera strip, et cetera, et cetera. Their whole model is built on trying to trade you up to the next version of the Gillette razor. And what he saw was um, that this basically leads consumers not to want to buy uh, the refills, which is- Yeah, what Rob, doing. sorry, can I just, just interrupt? I think we've still got a YouTube playing somewhere there in the background, so might might want to just stop that. We've got some groovy music, like, backing you up. <laughs> Yeah, it's not me. It's, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 it, doesn't, it, it shouldn't be me. <laughs> but, um, I, I hope you can hear me. But anyway, the, what, what the guy identified was the unmet consumer need. That it's very difficult to get people to buy razors um, once they bought once they bought the first set because they're so expensive. Um, so what he did was decide to um, change the model. So he went to China and, and made the products that was very similar to a Gillette razor, um, but made it much much cheaper. And effectively brought the people into a, a, a into a, a subscription model. So rather than buying the razors when you felt rich enough to buy them when you walk around the supermarket, he effectively brought those consumers into a subscription model. So that's great. That he, was, he did that under the premise of value, this whole dollar a month kind of um, uh, proposition. But in reality, because you're in a subscription, you're buying more regularly. So probably to a consumer, you're probably spending around the same. It felt like better value. But that's great business. They also built a product system around it. So not just selling razors, they're also selling uh, all the accoutrements of shaving, like creams, gels, um, skin conditioners, et cetera. And we've basically seen this business model copied by lots of other people. Um, there are businesses like Cornerstone in the UK or Harry's who do exactly the same thing. But fundamentally, it's become quite a successful business model. We're even seeing some of the companies like Cornerstone moving into other elements of men's health, like 
um, erectile dysfunction, hair loss, etc. So they're starting to sell other products uh, around what the consumers need. So what they've thought about is how do we leverage different elements into our business? And these businesses have become very successful, as I said. And, and Dollar Shave Club was actually bought by Unilever a few years ago for a billion dollars. So the guy set up a business on an idea, got it going, um, started to make money, got the attention of, uh, of such a large company like Unilever and was bought for a million dollars. It shows you how valuable these business models can be um, if you can do them well. So that's Donald Shave. Um, just trying to flip to the next slide. As I said, they were bought by Unilever. Um, Monzo is another type of business model. So there's been a, a huge rise in um, digital banking um, because, well, uh, Monzo is one of the great examples of this and they've, they've done um, really, really well with their, with, with their business model. But fundamentally, it's taking the whole experience of going into a branch and taking it onto your app. And we're seeing all the big branches, all the big banks now are following this model, but these guys who did it as part of their DNA have, have created excellent um, digital business models. So they've done some really cool innovations. So Monzo has a thing, um, for, for example, called drunk mode, um, which basically allows you to um, set um, a limit for um, your spending on an evening if you're going out. So in other words, if you get too drunk, you don't spend too much money. But it can also do clever things like looking at um, um, patterns. So if you're in weather spins all day and spend a lot of money, it can automatically prompt you to say, oh, are you sure you won't be spending any more money? So they're creating a really, really cool um, business intelligent and learning um, uh, model. And just like health, uh, finance is really important to understand data. And that's where um, digital really excels because you can track your spending, you can use the numbers to basically feedback uh, important insights to you as a, as a consumer. And um, so, as I said, um, the product's easy to use, has an excellent user experience and has um, other different bells and whistles, some of the unique features that you wouldn't get from other banking, have great customer service. Um, Monzo itself is actually a very cheap banking product, so it has lower fees. That's because fundamentally they don't have the infrastructure and the staff that a normal bank has, so they can provide the service at a lower cost. Um, their outreach to consumers is excellent, they have very creative branding, but they're also targeting the next generation of banking customers. So they're very highly, um, they have a massive penetration on millennials and gen Generation Z, who are not really um, sort of wedded to the Barclays and the Lloyds of this world. <clears throat> Um, so it's the 25th most popular consumer bank in the world, but it's the second most popular bank for millennials. So we really, really, uh, really, really identified their consumer and gone after it and had very great success there. And three and a half million customers is, is really good for a new bank. Um, so just, to, as I think we're coming towards the end here, but we, we're, um, we've, we've given you a lot of ideas and concepts on why you should be innovating, what disruptive innovation is, the role of digital um, in that um, ecosystem. But as any organization has to create a portfolio of innovation, and, and we're going to talk about with and now is what's the smart way to place your bets? Where do you need to be seeding your innovation? <clears throat> Uh, Rob, as well, just to add, uh, there's a few people that have asked questions. So for anyone that's asked questions, when we get to the end of uh, the next couple of slides, just before the end, we'll, we'll go through the questions and answer as best we can. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so um, this is a model of innovation that um, looks at the, the, the axes of technology against the consumer or market and, and basically sets out a blueprint for where you should place your bets. So if you look along the X, the horizontal axis, um, we have existing, existing but not used and new. So if it's an existing technology, it's in the first horizon. If it's an existing technology, but the company doesn't deploy it today, then that's an adjacent uh, in the next horizon. And if it's a brand new technology, then it's in the third horizon. We have a similar description for consumer or market. So if it's an existing consumer or market that they currently sell to, it's the first horizon. If it's an existing market, but it's just one that they don't um, sell to today, it's in the next horizon. If it's a new um, market or consumer, then it's in the third horizon. And we, class we, we classify these innovation um, types as incremental innovation, adjacent innovation, and radical innovation. So it's an incremental innovation if it uses an existing technology or serves an existing consumer or market. If you move into a, um, an adjacent um, uh, innovation, then it's actually using an existing technology that exists in the world, but that company doesn't deploy it today. 
And then if it's a brand new technology or a brand new market, it's a radical innovation. Um, so you can see how you create an innovation portfolio here. And what the, the received wisdom, and there's a lot of research behind this, is that you should allocate your resources 70% to incremental innovation, 20% to adjacent innovation, and 10% to radical innovation. Um, so that, 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 that's kind of um, what, what, what is a sensible way to uh, apply your resources. And what this means is you spend 70% of your time optimizing your current products and offering, 20% of your time moving into adjacencies, and 10% of your time and resources are moving into uh, radical innovations. And digital for many people will be a radical innovation. Um, and actually, um, these horizons are not, not, not defined by time. You would tend to assume that a radical innovation or an adjacent innovation would take more time than an incremental innovation. But actually, if it's digital, um, you could do radical digital innovation, which could be delivered actually faster than some incremental innovations would be um, delivered. So time is not necessarily a component here, um, but capability often is, because as you, as you move away from your incremental space, you're looking at new technologies on new markets that your business might not be familiar with. So you might have to adapt, you might have to work with different partners or get different skills to deliver um, adjacent radical innovation. Um, and also the 70% the of your, in, your incremental innovation, actually that, that, sounds like the, that, that sounds like the easy space to be innovating in, but actually it's often very, very hard to, increment, to incrementally innovate if you've been around for a long time. So if you have a product you want to do incremental innovation around it, the chances are you've already done a lot of the low hanging fruit. So subsequent incremental innovation becomes harder and harder and harder because a lot of the easy opportunities have gone. So often, it's often companies struggle to do incremental innovation they struggle to do radical innovation, but they find it easy to hop into adjacencies. But to have a balanced pipeline, you should, you should commit to a certain ratio and then um, make sure that you're initiating projects that fulfill this ratio. So that's some of the theory around an innovation portfolio. Um, so as we said, your innovation activity, you should put 70% of your time and resources into incremental, 20% to adjacencies, and 10% into the radical horizon. But actually what, this, what the research shows is you actually get the returns in the opposite way. So actually the 10% of time and resource you invested in radical innovation gives 70% of, of the returns and, and the 10% um, return comes from the incremental um, innovation. It's actually the opposite way around. So in other words, this is the incentive to do radical innovation. So getting those new skills and those new capabilities, evolving your business model to do more radical stuff, the incentive is there because you get more of your return from doing that activity. And there are lots of great examples about that. If you look at things like Google, the business that sits behind um, Google is called Alphabet. Today they make 90% of their revenue from um, digital marketing effectively because they use their insight from Google to sell advertising space. Um, in the next two to five years, they will be making more money out of health than they are from digital marketing. So they're moving their business model um, into more radical spaces for them. And that, as, as I said, they will be seeing more returns from the health space, which is their own verily compared to Google. Um, so we see how come like Alphabet are iterating this kind of thing. Um, okay, so that's the end of the, um, uh, the, the content. We're going to tell you a little bit about some of the supports available to you, but it's probably a good time to answer the questions now. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks rob Th thanks yeah so just before just before we move on to what the uh, wider or sorry move my laptop about because uh, my cat keeps attacking me the the joys of working from home um but yeah we've got a couple of questions that come in so um uh, one from earlier on um manufacturing and autom uh, or automation automation rather in manufacturing do we have um, some good examples or some um, good suggestions or tools um that manufacturers could be considering to bring automation into the manufacturing, into the factory? Well, clearly there are like technologies like robots, et cetera, where, you know, where, where robots are used to do um, lots of work today, often where things are dangerous, um, where you obviously don't want to risk human life. But um, ro robotics, for example, is a classic example of how you innovate in, in the manufacturing sector and use innovation. Another interesting technology for manufacturing is around um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you have um, a lot of data from your manufacturing suite, um, you might have lots of sensors in your mixers or along your filling line, that data can be used to look at preventative maintenance, 
can read it can be looking at prediction of demand can be doing lots of things like that um, so that's a couple of things so you know robotics or um, machine learning using the data lake to um, understand the data yes um on, on the note of ai uh, i've actually seen some really great examples where um manufacturers were using machine learning to look at uh demand for their products to make sure that they're basically making the, the correct amount of the product at the right time of year um, so they're not making uh, products that goes to waste so they're not buying too much um, materials in um, so it actually reduces the cost and makes them more efficient um, as a manufacturer uh, so I, I think that's that's quite a, a useful um, use of automation uh, in manufacturing and keeping the costs low. Yeah, nice one, the, other, yeah. the, other one, the other one that occurs to me is Amazon so um... Obviously, distribution is a, an important part of manufacturing. It's how do you get your product from your factory to your consumers or your market. And um, Amazon actually um, patented a predictive algorithm so that they have an algorithm that allows them to predict what, what people want when they want it. Um, and, but basically, that, what that allows them, they used to have a marketing slogan that said, what you want before you know you want it. So they can actually predict what people want in certain areas. Um, and they can make sure that the, the local distribution centers are already stocked up with those products so that when people order them, their, their lead time is shorter. That's one of the things that powers Amazon Prime. There's some really cool stuff going along. And obviously, they're experimenting with things like drones um, to distribute products. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's a really good example of what you were talking about, the innovation portfolio earlier as well. Um, so they spend a, and still do spend a lot of their time looking at how they can make the platform um, more efficient for people using it so things like predicting what you may want to buy um, using that for recommendations on the site for, for stocking the distribution centers um, and then things like the drones and, and the uh, smart home assistants I won't say the name in case anyone's got one um, you know that is was for them a radical innovation um, and there's a, a famous article in Forbes from Jeff Bezos who was saying that the, the whole concept of, of the smart home uh, automation, they started looking at probably nearly 10 years ago now. And it was just uh, kind of like a spin off project for their innovation team. It was just like one thing they were looking at. And now obviously that, that device is now a huge amount of their profit and is now the reason that Jeff Bezos is now one of the most profitable men in the world making the most money. Um, so they're a really great example of how you can look at that in terms of manufacturing then also how you can apply that to an innovation portfolio yeah and just on a very practical sense i mean you know a lot a lot of manufacturers have it but a lot of manufacturers really don't and that and that's being able to ensure that your your whole business is connected to what you're actually outputting so using something like a good erp system which connects what's happening in sales and in marketing and in the machines and in deliveries and logistics and finance and everything. And it connects all of this stuff together in the business so that it can all work efficiently and adjust aut automatically according to what the business is doing. Um, and, you know, and you can really get down to some really serious stuff where you start speeding up and slowing down machines. You start looking at the amount of waste material and recycling that material. You can literally monitor everything. Um, and I know within, um, uh, the, the support that's available, which uh, our, our colleague at Winner Moves is going to speak about shortly. There are some really good, um, there are some really good consultants that part that that can really advise on the very specifics of how to automate in, in, in manufacturing, um, saving cost um, and saving time and working out manpower and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's some really interesting stuff going on there. We're very much moving into that new t digital world when it comes to manufacturing. Um, so I think Mark, when he comes on, he'll, he'll touch upon that a little bit, but I hope that helps in, in, in the short term. Um, obviously you, we can follow up afterwards if you want some more specifics for your, um, your particular situation. Uh, another question that's on here. So I've just lost it. Um, so you provided some great examples of digital innovation. Um, as an SME, are there some key resources you could recommend to keep on the radar to support this type of horizon scanning? So yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, Sorry. I was just going to say, Alan, that there, um, what, what I think is very really important with this is, is, is having a culture of innovation in your organisation. You need to be able to um, you need to be able to have your guys looking at what's happening. So constantly collecting stimulus and insight from um, whatever sector you, it is you're in. So in other words, you know, you know your market, you know your consumer, you know your products today. You need to be having everyone in your organization tuned into the things that are going to affect your organization. 
So that could be global trends, it could be where the market's moving, it could be competitor activity, but it could be digital technology and, and new opportunities to leverage that technology. Now, I think I, you didn't say this in the question, but obviously if you're an SME, you have relatively few resources um, and it's often hard to devote this, um, this time to doing this, but if you really want to be innovative, you need to get those guys to be doing that. Um, there's, there's so much information out there about um, about what technologies are affecting different sectors. I actually think it's, it's actually really interesting to look at parallel sectors. So again, I don't know which sector you're in, but whichever sector you're in, look at parallel sectors and look at things that are happening in those sectors and work out how those technologies can be leveraged in your sector. So like we've mentioned augmented reality and virtual reality in this quite a lot. So, you know, like augmented reality is going to be all over our phones in the not too distant future. So today, um, you know, it's a, well, it has been a relatively niche thing, but people like Heinz have basically put um, triggers on, sauce, um, on ketchup bottles that basically create an augmented reality recipe. So you can basically um, you work out how to use ketchup in a recipe and Heinz are giving that content in marketing space. In the marketing space. So, uh, you know, um, uh, Ikea are using augmented reality so that you can try furniture in your room. So you basically download their app uh, if you want to try what one of their bookshelves may look like in your bedroom, you can basically augment that bookshelf in your bedroom and scale it to scale and see what it looks like and figure out whether you, whether you want to buy it or not. So that's an example of how those, those retail sectors are using augmented reality. What does that mean to your business? I think that's a good discipline to think about um, how you can leverage things to, 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 your, own, to your own business. Also, the, stuff, the support that's available through this program could be a way of um, uh, getting some resources to to, to keeping a, a, an eye on these horizons as well. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah, um, for me as well, when when we're looking at um, innovations and, and things like that, I always uh, look at it in sort of three areas. So there's three different types of research you can do to keep on top of these trends. So you have uh, internal research, which is looking at the way you're operating, the way you're interacting with your customers and the feedback you're getting. Um, there's uh, industry level research which is looking at what your industry is doing trends and behaviors within your industry and as rob said parallel industries um, and then you have uh, basically trend research which is wider global trends so um, cultural trends you know how people are changing in terms of um, culture and behavior based on what's going on uh, globally for example we're in the middle of a pandemic so that's obviously changed people's behavior quite a lot quite a lot um, new technologies that are coming out, uh, new things that are changing the global landscape. Uh, and if you look at trends across these three things, so internally, sector-wide and globally, um, you tend to be able to find patterns and things which you can then apply to your business. Um, you can find a lot of this just through looking online. Um, there's, there's various tools to help you do it. Um, I don't think we're allowed to do a plug, but we're, we're in the middle of developing one ourselves, which will be available soon. Um, so there is uh, trend scoping tools out there that you can find, um, but a lot of it and a lot of people are, are just doing it themselves. They're looking up their own industries, they're looking through new sites and they're just trying to find this information. Yeah, I think uh, just, just very briefly, it comes down to that culture thing as well. It's having that culture of innovation within your organization and whether that's you've got three people in the business or 300 people in the business, um, it's, it's an, enabling those, each of those individuals to bring ideas to the table. All of those, all of those people are looking at different things all the time, even subconsciously through their everyday browsing or whatever. Um, and it's, it's being able to encourage a culture where they can make the link between the stuff that they're seeing in their daily lives and things that pop up on their Facebook feed or what they see on Google or whatever, and relating that to what they actually do in their everyday job and, and, and having the freedom to come to work and say, listen, did you see that thing? I think this is quite interesting. I wonder if we could use that. And then given the time and the space to try, you know, to research that and look at it and say, well, how could we use it? What does it mean? Um, and uh, when you go through actually a process of uh, coming up with the innovations and, and you, we, we, we have a sprint process that we use, um, that, that's the sort of thing that you would use in stimulus and, and ideas and things that you've seen to, to um, influence how you can leverage that in, in your own business. So uh, a, a really crucial way is that the people that work with you or in your organization are, are, are your biggest asset when it comes to some of this. Uh, there's obviously technology uh, websites and um, various various online resources that you can go look at for what's new and what's coming out 
um, and you know you only have to Google it in the top 10 you'll see on there will give you all, all of that stuff uh, but real basic things as well when you're networking things online and you're talking to people join the groups join the sort of SME manufacturing group or the accountants group or whatever people are talking about this stuff every single day have you seen that new software? We're trying this. We found that the customers aren't really liking this anymore. So we're going to move to this and start sharing ideas. Um, you know, really it's, it's really a, a process of collaboration as much as it is, as much as it is research. But again, uh, Mark will talk through some of the favorite services that are available here. And th there's some quite sp specific support for any SME that wants to get involved and it's all free and it's all there to help you deal with your specific barriers. Um, so it feels like a good time to hand over Mark. Are you, are you, are you with us still? Uh, I am, yeah. Can you, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. Hi, yeah. Mark. Yeah. So I, I'll just hand over to you just to talk about what's come, what's available. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, follow that. That's, uh, that was fantastic. Thanks very much, guys. Masses of uh, ideas and great examples, tools and techniques and... Uh, and so on uh, that, uh, that that you share with us, and you know, whilst I, you know, I think you made the point that whilst um, not all of them are, um, uh, I, I, you know, necessarily directly relevant, but hopefully it gives you ideas of different ways of thinking and, and things that you can, uh, you know, things that you can pick up and adopt. So I, I'll just aim just to, to to round things off really with, um, uh, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, um, round things off really with, with just a bit of information about the uh, support that's uh, available that can can help perhaps make some of the things you you, you know you've heard today uh, become a reality really. So. Um, uh, we have um, a, a series of webinars, at least one weekly, on different topics, um, and uh, thought we'd just share the ones that are that, that are coming up. We've got another one later this week uh, about embracing digital technology uh, in a, a post-COVID world, which is a grand title. And obviously, what post-COVID will be it, it will be quite interesting to. Uh, to, to, to see, um, but certainly some, some ideas and, 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 and actually tapping into the thinking of some local Humber businesses that are really, uh, uh, really benefiting from, uh, from technology and, and making a massive difference to their businesses. Uh, we've got another one on, on next week. I think it's with you guys again, uh, which will be fantastic. Effective innovation for existing and new product offers. And then various ones that follow. So I won't read them all out, but you can see, see there's a bit of a mixture there in terms of um, you know, looking at doing things and seeing things in a different way, as well as uh, areas around efficiency, managing better projects, protecting yourselves through uh, through through cyber security and so on. So, range of uh, uh, of different uh, different areas. Then, alongside that, um, we have Digital Catalyst. So, this is a um, a, a great program where um, individually, as businesses, you can tap into one to one expert support. For your businesses covering literally any aspect of digital technology uh, adoption. Um, now, I'm pleased to say that, um, that, 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 that the guys you've heard today, uh, Jamie, Wayne, and Rob, uh, are part of that program. So, you know, they, they're able to uh, assist you uh, on, a, on a more direct basis. So, we're, with the questions and answers, we, uh, we were talking about things like how to innovate and uh, techniques and so on, and, and different areas of, um, you know, specific. Uh, manufacturing uh, innovations and so on those guys and we have a, a wider team are available to to actually work with you on a bespoke basis say right actually you know what do, how are you going to do this and and actually helping you with some fairly practical uh, support to uh, to move your business forward so just to give you in a, in, a, in a nutshell the digital catalyst offers so this bespoke one-to-one -one support from from our team of uh, technology specialists um, the you know the intention is very much for it to be stimulating and to uh, to to inject energy enthusiasm. So really to 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 help you with uh, finding new ways of thinking and developing creativity and uh, and and so on. And um, I, I think I've highlighted five areas there really. Um, yeah, it, I, and, and I think it sort of neatly covers the the variety of potential support available. Because um, one size doesn't fit all. If we we were to come in and uh, look to deliver a solution. Clearly, for a, for for a lot, if not most organisations, that wouldn't work. It'd be forcing something in. So, so really keen to um, keen to keen to understand um, you know requirements and to uh, bespoke the support and 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 so on to individual need. Um, so, it partly is about working more efficiently and effectively. So, finding ways of being more productive and and so on. Um, but then, the, very much the innovative side, developing new products and services 
enhancing, enhancing how you're working with your customers, winning more work through new clients and new markets and so on. But, but also people, you know, are looking to attract and retain uh, staff. You know, I think it's generally the case now that, uh, uh, you know, uh, individuals expect to be working in organisations that, uh, that use technology and, and embrace it. And of course, you know, the, 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 maybe the slightly less glamorous part, but keeping cyber safe and particularly, you know, in, in these times where we, we have more remote working and uh, of course, you know, with change as well as opportunity, um, you know, there's opportunity for the cyber criminals as well. So there's that side of side of things that we can we can assist with as, as well. Um, we also are aware of the various other support available. So it might be to, uh, you know, financial support to um, to progress and innovation. Uh, and, and we can sort of signpost to grants and, uh, and and funding as part of the activity, as well as introducing you to uh, suitable local technology providers who can actually help you take things uh, take things forward. And I think the thing is, it isn't all about strategy. So there is there's there's an element of yeah, how do you get started? And you know, our team are very keen to uh, uh, be involved in terms of rolling up the sleeves and uh, and and actually practically helping and uh, and and supporting. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, as a, at the end there, you know, it is about taking a shortcut. So the team of technical specialists we have, have um, really, you know, really, really have sort of fought the battles and so on. And, um, you know, they, they really, and they, they've learned a lot on the way. So hopefully, you know, what they, uh, they, they can sort of fast track you to the right solutions much more quickly without going through all the pain of, uh, of various sort of wrong turns and, uh, and so on. So very briefly, some example projects, but, but what we don't want to do is to say, you know, these are the projects because it could be other stuff, but think things like helping to move your operations to the cloud and consolidating technology infrastructure, uh, finding tools and applications to improve productivity, introducing e-commerce, introducing cybersecurity, online accounting, uh, implementing customer relationship management systems, very practical projects that uh, that we can help um, to uh, scope uh, having understood your needs. Uh, I guess, you know, it, it, that, that's the outcome of taking a very creative and innovative look at the uh, your business with you and identifying where the uh, where the, the, the biggest opportunities are and prioritizing those, fo focusing on those uh, on those first and, and as I say, helping to get you started. Um, some of the some of the sort of overcoming challenges. Um, so hopefully, you know, we're we're aware and can help with technologies that can really add value to 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 your 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 business. We, we've um, you know we are I guess the honest broker is the best way to describe um, in that um, you know the, the the support is provided free of charge. There's uh, and that we, we we have no uh, allegiance to any particular local provider or particular technologies. We're just interested in finding the right solution for uh, for your for your business. Um, we're hopefully able to judge which options offer greatest value for money. Uh, and deliver highest return on investment. So, and not just today. I mean, clearly we're, as, as Jamie mentioned, you know, we're in a period with uh, uh, of with, with COVID nineteen, where you know there has been a lot of change and, and and in a very short space of time. But it isn't just about today. It is about looking forward and thinking. Okay, what does um, the, as I think, I think Rob, you mentioned the new normal, but uh, as it, which is a, yeah, a, a funny expression, but but you know what, how how will this best serve you going uh, going forward? Um, it's also understanding the knock on effects with your operations and other technology, um, and and finding you know technologies that will integrate as far as possible with existing systems and processes, uh, and then you know helping to manage that technology uh, on an ongoing uh, on an ongoing basis. So the main aim for us is real and lasting impact. So, you know, we want it to make uh, the, the support and the time we spend with you, we want it to, uh, to have a positive impact, which means things like increasing business agility um, and, and, and resilience is mentioned, mentioned a lot of the moment. But, you know, looking at risk, risk is very traditionally is about being safe and what have you, but actually there's a great risk in terms of staying still. Business, business models are ever, ever shorter so um, you know, innovating and keeping relevant, keeping up to date is, of course, you know, absolutely essential. Um, helping to drive growth, improve profits, increase efficiency, uh, enhancing the customer experience. For I think I lost a little bit there, but uh, existing, uh, existing, and 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 uh, and new customers, 
attracting and retaining uh, retaining new staff and uh, staying safe. Perhaps repeat myself a little bit there, but just to uh, just to emphasise the, uh, the 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 point. So that's the details. Um, we do intend to contact you after the webinar anyway, but please, um, you know, if you like what we've heard and you think there's some areas we already from from what you've heard from the from 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 Jamie, Rob, and Wayne, as well as myself, please do reach out to us. Uh, we're here to help, and uh, as I say, there's no no cost to yourself as a as a business, yeah, and we'd be you know, very keen to uh, keen to help. So I think that brings us to the end of the uh, uh, end of end of the, uh, the the slides and uh, and and so on and the, and the content. Um, I'm very happy to take any uh, any final uh, final additional questions. I don't know. Is any any anything any additional questions come in, Wayne? Since the um... uh, no, nothing further, Mark. But I'm I'm happy to hang around just for a few uh, just for a minute if anybody's got any further comments or uh, questions um, that they want to fire over now that they'd like us to talk about. Um, if not, of course, we can. Um, you'll be in contact with them afterwards anyway, and we can look at very specific support to to your individual businesses. Um, but really, today was to generally give a just to give a general overview of the importance of um, embracing digital, really, and, and the opportunities that that provides. Um, just have a look. Oh, thanks, Alan. Sorry, I was firing a new question through. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, the. Um, yeah, to give a general overview, really, of what the importance of digital, you, you know, we talk a lot about COVID-19 and that's because it's the thing that's on the tip of our tongue. But really, this is very relevant well before this and well after this. Uh, you know, we're in a very much a digital led world and the way that people are accessing products, the way that they are accessing services, the way that we're living, eating, working or, or everything that goes with it. Um, involves some form of in, in, integration with digital technology and to be successful with your business and to continue to grow it's really important that you're you're embracing this and looking at how you can leverage it for for your own for your own business and this program here is designed to do exactly that work with you specifically on your specific needs with your specific business and come up with solutions to help you continue to grow um, and that's what it's all about so 